Hello, I'm Margaret Norrell with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching the Video Voters Guide. We, with Metro East Community Media, are here to talk with candidates who are running in the May 2020 primary election. I am here today to talk with Philip Wolf, Philip J. Wolf, who is running as Portland City Commissioner, position one. Welcome, Philip. Hello, hello, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. For uh, I think that it's so important to have this discussion to allow the community to learn more about why we're running. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Philip, will you please tell us about yourself and why you are running and what can unique characteristics you have among all the candidates? Absolutely. I ran previously in 2018, challenging Nick Fish, who was the incumbent. From that experience and going through the entire election process, the goal was not necessarily for anything else other than to raise awareness and to raise a voice to call out concerns related to accessibility issues that continuously popped up during my campaign and previously in the time leading up to it. So now in this time, in 2020, I'm feeling like it's my time to run again and to actually get elected and to take office. I've seen many, many concerns here in Portland and have many concerns about Portland. For example, our houseless crisis, that we have not properly addressed and found any solutions for. We now also have a global pandemic and an emergency that is compounding on top of this already concerning crisis within our community. Of course, concerns regarding accessibility, but access and accessibility is not just about providing an accommodation alone. Accessibility is a myriad of things. It means better transportation, better quality of life, access to clean air, access to everything in our life, everything in the world that you could imagine needing to live. Having that in one area means that we have accessibility to it. Right now, we don't have access to all of these things we need for a sustainable life, and that means that we're failing on access. When it comes to the other candidates, we have all pretty much the same goal. We want to change the city for a better future. That's true. However, something that's unique about me as a candidate and why I feel that I am the one that can bring the real change that we all want is that I bring more representation to city council than anyone else. As a queer person, as a deaf person, as a Jewish person and someone who identifies as non-binary, who also has been a well-known activist who has made sure that the community knows what I want, that we are on the same page and building resonant relationships with those community people. I've been at City Hall, I've been fighting for the change, and I've successfully passed ordinance regarding captioning and other types of accessibility. I show up and I raise my concerns. I make proposals, I make challenges. I'm not complicit to the issues that I've disagreed with and that the problems that I've seen in this city and I have no other selfish motivation other than exercising my care and my value for the city of Portland. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting devastation of small business, city employee layoffs, and housing displacement will be with us for some time. How would you seek to address the fallout, including the re reduction in city revenue? This is a great question. First, I wanna start with the fact that our state govern governor, uh, Kate Brown, 
ordered a moratorium that I feel was limited. It was too limited in its scope. It required that any deferred payments would be paid back within a six month period after the moratorium ended. But as we already know, up to 30% as of right now of Americans have lost their jobs due to coronavirus and COVID-19. This is a third of Americans and the number is increasing every single day. So the expectation of this moratorium that people would be able to pay back this back rent, I would expect would lead to a mass houseless crisis and mass house suicide. If we had someone addressing the issue in a way that was saying that for three to six months, maybe even April and May, rent was excused. If we also found solutions for small businesses to freeze their rent and mortgages. I believe that if we address the issues in this way, we could become a model for improvement for other countries, or excuse me, for other areas to show that it's a very easy way to handle the crisis by not just deferring these payments, but actually freezing them. I, I don't own a car myself. I do walk around the city. I don't use public transportation. So I often have to defend myself and protect myself. As I make my way through downtown, I see many, many, many gaps in access, this access that I was talking about. Our city council does not understand what these gaps look like. They don't experience them. I don't know if it's that they don't care or they simply don't know. I just want to give a scope of what my experience and what I see every day. An example of this gap of accessibility would be something currently using Wi-Fi nearby. Let me just show you at the Apple store in downtown Portland. The Apple Store is the only place that I could find that had open Wi-Fi that was still running in the area because most businesses have been affected by COVID-19. A lot of free Wi-Fi that community members use is now no longer accessible. There's also not plugs. So I had to charge my phone and prepare for this to make sure that I had enough battery to connect to the Wi-Fi and do the entire interview. So I want people to know where they can access Wi-Fi. We need people to know where they can access bathrooms. We need people to know where they can access other public services. But this type of information has not been made readily accessible during this crisis. And so this is just two examples of how I would address the, uh, the, the issues by prioritizing people above all else. Um, and I think that I'll probably leave it to there for now. But if you had more follow-ups on other actions I would take, bring them on. <laughs> Um, if the next question is actually, if if we maintain the current government, what city bureau would you like to oversee and why? It would be awesome if I could have two bureaus to focus on, to have projects that I could really, uh, you know, show my motivation, show my skills, and show my passions off. Uh, at this point, though, I really don't mind. I just need an office with high-speed internet, and I'll get things done. You know, I'll be able to network into any bureau. But the two that I think that I would love is Portland Police, PPB, the Portland Police Bureau and also an accessibility bureau. We need to establish a bureau of accessibility of some kind that relates to general access across the board for all of our community citizens, the type of access that I've been talking about. So those are the two that I would want. Um, we have about two more questions and about two minutes left. Um, how would you address the public's significant concerns about police community relations, the use of deadly force, and officer accountability?
<clears throat> Police is something that I can absolutely speak to. When the CDC guidelines were ordered by Governor Brown and also supported by Mayor Ted Wheeler, they were very clearly explained that we require face masks, social distancing, other types of PPE. As I've been walking outside, I see police officers not using masks, not using gloves, not practicing social distancing, interacting with the community, touching objects and things in their face. This is an obvious concern during a pandemic, especially when officers are the ones who are out engaging with the public, with houseless people, and in many different areas of the city. So I've taken pictures and I've recorded this type of activity, and I've even had officers who have seen me and felt a little bit embarrassed and sort of hid themselves in their crew and then put a mask on and put some gloves on. It's as if they know that they've been caught. And this just goes to show that the police already knew the guidelines and already knew what they should be doing and decided not to do it and decided not to even fix it until they were caught being recorded. Uh, they, at that point, could already be infected, already be dirty, and it doesn't matter. And so I'm not trying to, to you know, go against the police by any means and, and say anything negative, but this is absolutely a complaint that we need to push for our public models to be modeling the behavior that is expected of us from our government leaders. And so I've posted things on social media, asking followers to share that, that that picture would then go viral to try and bring attention to the fact that uh, our community protectors are not protecting themselves. So this is just a couple of things I don't want to go too far in, but that's just one small example uh, in the grand vision of things. Um, the city's park system faces serious financial challenges, even more so since the pandemic. What ideas do you have for securing the financial stability of the park system? So I do want to go back and just re-emphasize a point uh, about this than the finances, but uh, in relation to the moratorium. We obviously know that the moratorium impacted so many of us financially. Many people also then don't qualify for other types of financial assistance. So they may have to do financial aid, food stamps, use other types of resources. Then the city has to, to uh, change where its spending is happening in sort of an emergency situation just to try and support its citizens. And so um, I think that we've even already talked about these full moratoriums, uh, this full rent freeze. There's different ways that we can allow our community members to breathe a little bit, that our city then can breathe a little bit, not have to so much worry about where this money is going to support people during rent and how they're going to pay things back. Instead, we can support things like the park system and uh, we can survive uh, through and beyond things like this pandemic. Thank you. This has been the Video Voters Guide. Thank you for watching. The primary election is on May 19th, a Tuesday, and we hope that you will keep yourself informed and all about the candidates and the ballot measures, and that you will exercise your right to vote.